Thank you. Perfect. All right, it works. Um, hi, everyone. All right, let's get started. Blockchain. Block. Sorry, guys. Blockchain has taken the people over a roller coaster of emotions over the past few years. People saw it as an opportunity to become overnight millionaires to the next day cussing out cryptocurrencies and all of them. All of a sudden, they then tried to dabble into random NFTs and then went back into cussing out anything blockchain related. And as with any new technology, blockchain has its die-hard followers who will support its every move and it has its consistent skeptics who will consistently voice out their dismissals. So, where does the truth lie? Will blockchain change the world like the invention of the smartphone or the internet did? Or will it eventually die out and make everyone, like me, look like complete idiots? Honestly, the followers got it right this time, but not in the way they think. Now, a little backstory. My name is Daniel. I know they mentioned it in the beginning, but just reinstating. And I come from a family which forgot to add the terms rest or staying put in their vocabulary. Needless to say, Sunday sleep-ins was never really a thing in our household. We were always struggling uh, to stay up till or stay past 12 when we wanted to sleep because our parents used to say we were in trouble if we did. And we moved a lot of countries during my childhood. I was born in Germany, lived there for seven years, then went to the UK, lived there for three years, then to the US, lived there for three years, then went to Pakistan, lived there for two years, then Mauritius, lived there for four years, and now I'm here. So if you're struggling to figure out what my accent is, you're in the same boat as me. I don't understand it either. And this constant shifting around for a lot of people would have been very troublesome when they were young. But I had the advantage of being a pretty naive child. For me, it was relatively simple. New school, need to make new friends, and we're all good. And this ignorant philosophy really did help me when I moved to countries such as the States or the UK, but completely shattered when I moved to my home country, Pakistan. I mean, the stark differences in culture, in food, and in people was both amazing and terrifying at the same time. All of a sudden, I was seeing drivers drive in whichever lane they saw fit, even if it opposed traffic. I heard swear words from strangers, which were a lot more impactful than English swear words will ever be. And I was, seeing, I was also smelling the most amazing food that will make you die of hunger. All of this, by the way, I learned on my first drive back from the airport on the first day. Imagine what I learned during the rest of my time there. Absolutely love my country. However, at that time, you also start learning about the difference in living standards between developing and developed nations. We went from nice Sunday family drives in Germany to getting hoarded by children at every traffic light in Pakistan who were begging for money. We went from playing in parks in America un unaccompanied by our parents to being told that we have to go home, school, and then home due to the security concerns in Pakistan. Even at the age of 14, you start asking the grand question, why? Why do we see such a large difference in these countries? Why my country? And how is this fair? And it's this love for my country which makes it extremely difficult to say that we are not going through the best of times right now. Instability in governance, a struggling economy. And on top of that, last year, we faced a climate crisis with extreme flooding that displaced over 33 million Pakistanis who are still struggling to this day. To put that into context, imagine a flood that displaces half of the UK population. Pretty intense. The support we've received globally has not merely been anywhere near enough. And it's tough to rely on your own governing bodies when they see this as another opportunity to make money through corruption. So in situations like the flood, the people displaced 
tend to have access to phones and internet, but they do not have access to their traditional banks. So you start asking yourself the question, how can we help the people in need? How can we support them without physically having to be there? How can we make sure that the money and aid that we are sending is being sent to them? That's where blockchain comes in. Now, before delving deep into the specifics, it's important to understand what the term blockchain means. Whenever I use the term blockchain, majority of people shift their minds towards the traditional cryptocurrencies, your Bitcoins, your Ethereums. And I know a lot of you might have even checked your phones during this to see your portfolio and let me save you the suspense, you're still down. <laughs> However, Bitcoin and Ethereum are just a sole application of what blockchain technology can be. The potential for it's a lot further. And I want to explore how in this, call, in this talk. Now, the definition of blockchain technology is a technology that helps you store and transmit data without any centralized server. That's it. That is all it is. But what it does is it completely eradicates the concept of middlemen. In the finance industry, these middlemen are your banks and brokerages. In social media, these middlemen are your tech giants, your Facebooks, your Twitters. Middlemen tend to take all the power, control things exactly how they like it, because they know you, you can't survive without them. For example, if Twitter wants to shut down your profile, a profile that you might have worked years upon, a profile which you might have even developed a career upon, they can and they don't need to tell you why. If a bank wants to be reckless with your hard-earned money, they can, and they don't need to tell you where they're spending that money. I mean, just have a look at what's happening with Silicon Valley Bank these days. Blockchain takes traditional concepts and makes them decentralized. It brings the ownership and power back to the people who actually own these assets. Now, I get asked a lot of questions. I get asked, Daniel, why would I want such a thing? I have enough stress in my day-to-day -day life as it is. Why would I want to take care of everything I own? I like that someone else is taking care of it for me. And my answer back has always been, every single day, we're seeing more and more examples of the people we have trusted, the institutions that we have trusted with our assets completely violate that trust. The 2008 financial crash. Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg with how he handles your ads. Silicon Valley Bank. And let me tell you, in the next few weeks, this will not be the last bank to drip dip. Every single situation, they have violated our trust. And it's more important for you to learn before you get hurt to make that transition and that the only person who cares about your assets is you. So, in the situation like the flood, how can this technology help? Well, it can help a lot with aid relief. With aid relief, we face three major issues. One, the support is never enough. Two, we're not sure the money and aid that's being sent is actually being sent to the people because of corruption. And three, it's hard to get all this aid to the right people because they're often displaced. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about point one, that's a political issue, so let's, let's stay away from that one a little bit. However, blockchain can definitely be a saving grace for the other two. Let's explore how. UN has recently been piloting a program in which it's helping the displaced people in Ukraine by sending them cryptocurrencies. Now, as I explained before, People who are displaced don't, have te don't tend to have access to their traditional banks, yet they still do have access to their phones and the internet. That is, the beauty of cryptocurrency is that is all you need to get the money to, through. So what UN has been doing is they have been using stable coins, which is a cryptocurrency whose value is always one US dollar, and they have been sending it to the people displaced straight to their phones, straight away, with the exact money they require, and there's no intermediaries involved. Now, setting these types of systems in a country, in developing nations where corruption is so large, you have completely destroyed corruption being an issue in aid money. An extremely powerful use case. 
Another really interesting use case is relief supplies. Now, a lot of countries, a lot of institutions, a lot of organizations will decide, hey, I don't want to send money to the people involved. Rather, I will send them food and shelter. I want to support them in the short run. And a massive issue with relief supplies that we don't realize is the loss of relief supplies from, from origin to destination when they're sending it through. You can blame that loss on corruption. You can blame that on poor logistics. We don't know. Now, imagine a supply chain system in which every single step is tracked. And within two to three seconds, you'll be very easily can tell where these lost supplies are and who is accountable for these lost supplies. The best way to explain it is imagine using Microsoft Word versus Google Docs for a team project. Microsoft Word, you are waiting for everyone in your project to finish all the information, send you the email with the document, and now you can work on it. Great. Now once you have the document, you're not sure who's done what, and the only way you can find out is by asking your team members. Now let's say you have a dishonest team member, it becomes a lot harder to hold them accountable. Google Docs, on the other hand, Everyone's working collaboratively. Everyone can see what each other is doing. But more importantly, Google Docs is tracking every single change that's being made on that document. So if, there, if you add anything, if you delete anything, Google Docs is tracking that. And you cannot change that. You cannot interfere with that. A blockchain supply chain system is exactly like Google Docs. Every single step is tracked. It can't be interfered. And everyone is held accountable for what they do. An extremely powerful use case in the relief supplies, but also in business in general, as shown by Walmart. Now, disaster recovery is amazing. The people who are in trouble helping them out is great. Being efficient in doing it is amazing. However, if you are a citizen from a struggling nation in Africa, or you have experienced poor standards in South Asia, you understand that disaster recovery is merely not enough. You understand that there should be people, there should be institutions, there should be systems in place to ensure that these types of disasters do not cause such an impact, do not halt your country in the way they usually do in these developing nations. At the end of the day, all you want to do is you want to become a developed nation. And blockchain can help a lot in that journey as well. One of the very interesting use cases is elections. So, Everyone knows the first step towards progress, towards growth for these types of nations is the removal of bad actors, bad people, bad politicians, whatever you want to call them. Elections have become a hallmark system to be consistently rigged by certain individuals to keep the power in their hands. It seems like in many of these cases, the people of these countries are living in a dictatorship with the illusion of it being a democracy. Until now. Now, as I explained before, blockchain allows you to shore, store, share, and transmit data without any interference. So imagine an election system on the blockchain. Votes could be registered, they can be added up, and the results can be transmitted without anyone being able to interfere in the entire system. Pretty hard to rig an election when you don't have access to the system. Another really interesting use case is supporting the unbanked. 57% of the African continent remains unbanked. That means banks looked at the African continent, saw 57% of them, and said, you're not profitable enough for us. That means 57% of these people are limited to cash transactions only. Guys, the world is moving digital. And these guys are lagging behind. However, in the same continent, 82% of these people have internet access. As I explained before with Ukraine, all you need for cryptocurrencies is a phone and the internet, a device and the internet. We're seeing a lot more opportunities open up for these types of people since they've been involved in the world of blockchain. We're seeing a lot of developers now work at a top US salary, 100K, 200K, 300K, because it's easier to get paid. We're seeing a lot of African startups get funded a lot easier because it's easier to get paid. Even in general, we're seeing a lot more people buy, sell, trade in the digital, in the digital world a lot more easier and potentially develop an income through it, just like we do usually in our houses over here in the UK. Amazing, extremely powerful. 
Now, the final use case is a really interesting one, and it's the problem of inflation. Now, a lot of these countries face a lot of inflation, and that's why, especially in Africa, you're seeing Bitcoin be accepted as legal tender in a lot of these nations. Countries like Venezuela, who are facing hyperinflation, can now use cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, to put a halt to that. All of a sudden, instead of firefighting every day, you now have an easy escape. Something that allows you to take a step back, understand what's happening to your country, and try to rebuild it again. There's still a lot of discussions on whether this is a long-term solution or just a short-term placeholder. However, in either case, even if it's just for short-term, it's better to not firefight for a little bit and try to figure out what's going on and rebuild your foundations once again. So, I ask again, why will blockchain be the next big thing? Because blockchain doesn't trust the big guys. Because blockchain doesn't allow corruption. Because blockchain empowers individuals. Because blockchain creates stability. Because blockchain provides equality. Because blockchain levels the playing field for every developing nation out there. That's what blockchain is. And that's how it's going to change the world. Thank you.